Right, so I thought I'd start with something. Uh... Right, Donald Rumsfeld is not my favorite person, but he made this quote at some stage in his, his career and everyone laughed at him a lot, but I thought it's actually quite, it's, it's actually very true. There are known knowns, there are known unknowns, and there are unknown unknowns, he said, and everyone went bleh. But if we look at this, and Don Ronsfeld's point was that the unknown unknowns are the ones that you're gonna get you really hard, because they're the ones you couldn't predict. And I think recently we can see that perhaps uh, COVID was an unknown unknown, huge impact on everyone, the war in Ukraine. Perhaps even if you look a bit further back, Brexit. Not many of us would have predicted that happened, but anyway, these things are with us. But there are lots of things in life that we think are probably known knowns, and what I want to talk about today is they're not. And unless you proactively look after them, they will cause you the same amount of trouble as you could have got elsewhere. So basically, we're trying to turn things which are perhaps known unknowns into something which you can manage in your business. And um, as was mentioned, I have worked with a number of operators. And, and the problem is, is that you sometimes you know because you've worked in the industry for a long time, you've seen the things which cause trouble. You try and proactively explain to someone, unless you manage this, you're going to have a bit of trouble. But unless it bites them in the backside, they don't believe it. But hopefully, um, spread the word on some of the things that cause trouble and how you can get rid of that trouble. Okay, so as I said, sometimes things we know, we think we know about, start changing under our feet, and that's where you have trouble. And the two I'm going to talk about are addresses, very well known, and also open reach PIA data. Many of you probably have experience of this. It underpins most of the alt-net rollouts, and it's, it's a blessing and also slightly troublesome um, asset. So as mentioned, I'm going to talk about types of change that happen in these and the rate of change, and then the impact this has at different stage in your business, because when they change when you're planning, it's different from when you're selling. So I'd like to talk a bit about that and how you can proactively manage this in order to get rid of the problems in your business and streamline process around about change. So I'll start by talking about addresses, and addresses are something that most people think are very well known. They're static, you have an address, that's where you live. And, but they're a key asset, for, especially for all the alt nets, because you've got to know what demand there is that you're going to build to, what the type of demand there is, and it underpins all the things through the build process, but also sales. So at high level planning, through to low level design, through to build, through to sales, addresses are something that you really have to know something about. But managing addresses is a global headache. I'm going to talk a little bit about addresses in different countries. Um, I'm going to talk about addresses in the UK, uh, which we work in very much at the moment, Ireland and Denmark. I'm going to avoid countries where addresses are a bomb site, which is anywhere in the Americas, the Caribbean or Africa. Um, so I'm, I'm just not even going to go there. But we're going to talk about some places where you think they're quite well behaved. So if we talk about the UK, um, anybody that's worked will probably have used address-based premium data. This comes from the Ordnance Survey. It's a product from the Ordnance Survey, and it's great. They've taken all the addresses from the post office, from everywhere else, pulled them together, and you can buy either the entire UK or you can buy sections of it in order to underpin your immediate plan, design, and build. And one of the nice things about them is that UK addresses are very well behaved. They have a, and a unique ID, which is the UPRN, and that will not change under your feet, which is nice. However, the addresses which you get are not just for residential and commercial, which are the places that you might want to build. They're for everything. So, oh, I'm going to use the smart thingy now. Here we go, is that it? There we go. Right, so if we have a look over here, for example, this list up at the side shows, I think that there are around 560 different classifications of addresses. And these cover things which can be residential properties, they can be commercial properties, but they can also be um, oyster beds, they can be statues, they can be whatever. So before you can use the addresses that you've had provided, you have to figure out which ones you actually want to sell to. And in the, in the diagram on the right, it might be a bit unclear. What I've tried to show is, um, so after this filtering, looking through all the different classifications, uh, you can decide which ones you think are relevant to yourself. And the things which are sort of in a sort of greeny blue are the addresses which someone's decided they want to take from the 
uh, Ordnance Survey. And the things that you can see, a couple of them highlighted in magenta, those are also addresses. So you have addresses everywhere, which are probably, you probably don't want to build to the middle of the street. So who knows why it's there? It's a historical address. Maybe they repurposed the land. But you can also see ones hanging about in people's back gardens and so on and so forth. I mean, the addresses you get are quite remarkable. I have been through the entire list. Yes, I have been called a geek in the past or someone. But you get things which are for, um, for ponds which are put in place for people to attract ducks so that they can shoot them. You know, you have, you have addresses for everything. Anyway, so that's, that's one of the things about dresses. They're well behaved, they don't move, and they've got a unique ID, but you get addresses that you probably don't want to do anything with. But that's not the only type of address information that is useful when you're um, building a new network. As we know, there's funding for certain addresses if they're rural in Britain at the moment. So you will also get additional information through as to which ones you can get perhaps as part of the funding scheme or as perhaps as the voucher scheme. And that's a very important asset to manage. But the other thing, and anyone who's done a survey or been part of a network build will know, that when you go out, you will find addresses which aren't part of the ordnance survey data. And this is a major headache, because you go out there and you find there's a new estate that's coming along. It's not documented yet. But you're going to want to build to it. Or someone's taken that house which was a big old house and they're splitting it into six flats. Well, you kind of have to know about that because the way you're going to supply the six flats is different from the way you would have supplied the one house. So you have to pull the survey addresses in as well, and they do not have a unique ID, of course. And at some stage in the future, that address will come back through from the Ordnance Survey, and you're going to have to try and glue them together. So this is an ongoing and immediate problem for absolutely everyone. You don't have to be an Altnet, BT, or OpenReach have exactly the same issue. So what's the rate of change on addresses? Um, well, you can get a refresh on the address-based premium data every six weeks. And that will include inserts, updates, and deletes. So the inserts are probably related to things you might have found on survey. New build, new estates coming through where something's been um, mad, uh, has been identified. And those will often have to be, you will then have the problem if you've gone and got the survey addresses of how to match them together. Updates. This is perhaps less expected. You can get simple updates, which can be someone's changed their house name, so it used to be Casamia, and now it's you know done roaming or whatever. Now that doesn't really matter when you're building a network. It does matter if you're sending out a postal bill to somebody. So these things are important that you trap them. But things which are important also are you can change the usage type. Something could have been an outbuilding, and now it's becoming a commercial property. You didn't want to wire to it, you want to wire to it. You have to know about that because it changes your plans. But a thing you might not expect is that the location of addresses can also change quite dramatically. We were working with an altmet. Anyone who can tell me the name of this one from this clue, you get a prize later. South Coast wiring up Southampton, doing the bit around the docks. It's tube. Right? So they were down there doing this, and it's an awful lot of property being redeveloped, which is turning into residential flats. And so they had the position of all of the um, addresses, and they had a 15% change in where the addresses were in that particular area. They moved by more than 20 meters. So if you're doing a build where you're doing it up the facade into it, that kind of matters as everything just swapped. But Another bigger one, and we had this with another, um, it was the Ordnance Survey had decided to pre-allocate addresses to a new housing estate, and they found that one of the streets, which was going to be called, I don't know, Swallowtail or something, they actually decided that street was going to be over here. So all of the addresses moved by more than 800 meters. So if you'd have been planning to it, absolutely everything swapped about in the plan. So you really do get a lot of things moving as well, which is, can be a problem. And then you get deletions, because properties get demolished. Um, so that happens. So that's, that's the rate of change that goes on in the UK. That's the, the, the rhythm of change. Whether or not Altnets decide to keep track with the six weeks is, is another matter, because it's hard work trying to keep up with change. So I'd like to talk a bit about Ireland. Um, Ireland is also quite well behaved in terms of addresses. So most operators use data that comes from a thing called geodirectory. 
And they don't do it quite the same way as Britain. So the main focus is on the building, and the building has a unique ID. And each building then has one or more addresses inside it, which are, can be commercial and residential. And some of the addresses have unique IDs, except they can change them when they want to. But an awful lot of the addresses don't have an ID at all. They just say, all right, here's a building, it's got six flats in it, and here's the addresses for three, and there's another three. So that makes sales challenging, as I'm sure you can imagine. But also, they will flip the ID of the properties inside the buildings. And again, they've got the thing about finding new addresses during survey. The company that we've mainly been working with Ireland recently is the one that's doing the rural rollout. They find enormous amounts of addresses which are not in the directory because no one's ever put them in. So little re re remote um, houses. But also, one of the things that they're quite often wiring up are things like milking parlors because they're quite high-tech milking parlors and there's an awful lot of data that gets transferred about the volume and the quality of the milk and so on. So, you know, there's, there's that getting captured as well. So, this geodirectory gets updated every three months and we just did one of the upgrades last week, actually. And one of the problems we found is that 30 of the properties that got deleted have got an active service on them. So, then you have a bit of a problem because clearly you can't just delete the building that said it was because you've got an active service on it. And they had another hundred which were um, uh, sales which were going through and deployments going through to addresses which have apparently been demolished. So this is a, this is a problem. What do you do about it? So over to Denmark. Um, Denmark are very well behaved as well. They do a similar thing to Ireland in which you have an address to the building and then you have, an, uh, you have an address for the customer address within the building. And they do that even for single dwelling units. So if you live in a house just yourself, you will have an access and a specific address. They all have unique IDs. They're very well behaved. But if you look at the bottom, this might be surprising. This is the rate of change in addresses in Denmark. Every day, 500 addresses are updated. That's about 170, 180,000 a year. And Denmark's not very big. So that is a typical rate of change on addresses for business to cope with that's doing stuff with, um, you know, building. It's a lot. I think it's probably a lot higher than people expect. Everyone thinks addresses are just there, but they're not. So what's the impact? Well, it has a different impact at different stages in the plan, design, and build process. If you were going for some of the funded addresses, and all of a sudden you find there's another 50 over here, it's going to make quite a big change to your business plan as to which area you're going to build in first. So that's your first thing. You have to know about stuff. Um, how many are you going to get there so you can do cost estimates? And when you get into design, it has another impact. So high-level costings is one thing, but when you get down to the nitty-gritty, okay, I've decided I'm going to put an 80% build rate in and I'm going to have a, you know, a four by eight split ratio and I have to have so many fibers spare at this point. And then all of a sudden, boom, you've got another 30 addresses turned up for a housing estate. That has quite an impact on your plan and you better redesign it quickly. Otherwise, when you go out there, you're gonna miss the ability to sell to all of those properties, which is, which is bad. So you really need to know about these changes quite early on. Also, if things moved, you know, in the situation I was talking about with the housing estate swapped, you'd better know about that because you probably planned rolling it out like this and now they're all somewhere else. So you have to use different assets to get there. So, um, so this is all, you know, important information all the way through the process. And of course, when you're building, if a building's now marked as being demolished, then please don't drive I'm sorry, don't drive 200 meters down the road to go and put fiber to that house that's just been demolished. I know that you're at the end of a lane, so. But it's not just on plan design and build, it's also, of course, operational. Addresses are the unit of sale. So if something's changed that someone needs to know about, you'd better make sure you're managing it correctly. One of the key things that we work with, we do IT systems, and it's supporting plan, design, build, operations, integration with the CRM, et cetera. You better make damn sure that when the addresses come through, you're marking the readiness for service state correctly. Quite a few people we've worked with have decided that the right way to do this is to have a build unit, and when you've built the unit, you stamp that down as being in service. 
Great, so now you can sell to it. But the problem is, is if you have a whole bunch of new addresses that turn up in that area, which you can't actually provide service to because you haven't actually designed to them yet, and you've got, a, you've got a key performance indicator that says, I've got to be able to install it within, I don't know, five days of taking the order, you're doomed because you won't be able to because you haven't got the network to it. So you've got to make very sure that all parts of the business are aware of the impact of changes on the fact that things can suddenly turn up or disappear. And the, the deleted addresses is a real problem because, all right, don't want to generalize too much. In Ireland, I do not believe that this was something dodgy going on. There probably is a legitimate service and somebody just messed up which address it was to. Or maybe GeoDirector got it wrong, who knows. You could find all sorts of other reasons for active services being demolished addresses in other parts of the world. So this is the big takeaway from this. This stuff, which you probably thought was quite solid and settled and didn't change much, does. It changes all the time and it has an impact on your business. So the best thing to do is to try and manage the change proactively. So if you've got clear information about it, you can figure out what to do. As I've said, for inserts, you need to be able to understand which parts of the network, if you're actively building in an area where there's been change to the addresses, you need to be able to tell the planner immediately what's gone on so that they can change it. Because change when you're planning is much, much simpler than changing after you've built. So you need to get the information through. And same for the updates, you need to be able to tell them. And for the deletions, you need to be able to follow up somehow this deletion's come through, what on earth is going on, change the design, don't build here, or tell the build team not to do it. So what do you need in order to do this? Well, you need some systems, obviously. You need some systems in place. You need, first of all, to be, you need to be able to identify all of the changes that come through an address, whether it be from survey, whether it be from the funding bodies, whether it be from the ordnance survey, you need to be able to track all the changes coming in and to check them against your network and also your services so that you can see which ones have an impact or not. And you need to put that information online and proactively push it to the people who are impacted. If this designer is working in this area and there's a whole new stuff come through, push it through to them. If it's through to the people that are doing sales or marketing and they need to know that there's a new area that they can sell to, push it to them. But also, check that they did something with it. Because an awful lot of people will start on this process when they have a problem, but then they won't follow through. So you may say you have to have a process in place which means that you have to redesign the section of a network. You have to make sure that someone was empowered to do it, tasked with doing it, and actually bloody did it. So, that's what you need to manage change proactively. Now I'm going to go on to PIA, which is an, it's a living part of my life at the moment. I never thought that would be the case when I was a little girl. So anyway, PIA, Physical Infrastructure Access, is, I'm sure you're all aware of this, this is the way that OpenReach will give access to infrastructure to build through phone and broadband services. And uh, the picture I've got on the right here is so there's two ways of getting the data. There's a portal, which you can go to from OpenReach, where you can log in and pull things. Or there's a series of APIs that have been developed where you can automatically integrate and ask for the information out. So what I'm showing on the right-hand side here is some PIA data. Uh, it's not from the portal. This is data that's been pulled and integrated into someone's planning system. And you could perhaps see that it's colored in different colors. So all the data that comes through on the ways or the ducts is, uh, has got a rag status. Red means here there be dragons. It's probably either full or it's blocked. Amber means you can use it if you think you dare. And green means it's good. But anyone who's been out in the field using this data will know that it's not the most reliable of statuses. So therefore, usually what people will do in an area is if there's a really good way of getting through, they will try it anyway, just to see if you could actually get a duct through it because it can be much quicker using the ones which are red than using the ones which are green. So people will pull this. You can perhaps see there's different things on it. There's poles, there's chambers, there are uh, the central offices. There's all sorts of stuff, uh, sorry, exchanges, 
went a bit American there. Um, so anyway, all this data comes through and then you can use it for your planning and design. Now that's great, that's the data access from OpenReach, but when you want to use the network, you then have to start placing orders. Now the first thing that you have to do, if you want to do an intrusive survey, or if you want to place duct, or anything of that sort, is you have to raise an NOI. So you have to raise a notice of intent. And inside, anyone who's ever tried doing one of these will know they're quite finicky. So you're only allowed to have a certain, num a certain diameter of ducts inside another duct, unless you've got more than three, in which case you multiply it by 0 0.75 and, you know, they're, they're, it's quite complicated and NOIs are, are split down into roots and each root can have 50 point type things and 50 line type things in it. And you can have, is it 15? I think it's 15 roots in, a, in an NOI. So lots of constraints around about it. And so if you're doing a build, typical thing would be you've got a new area of access that you want to build in. You will then go, perhaps when you're doing survey, you might want to grab everything because you just don't know what you can use. Because as I said, it's uncertain as to whether the data that's there is going to be correctly documented or not. So you want to pull a lot of it. And what I've got highlighted in magenta here is a typical sort of area that you might want to pull for a little bit of access build. So this will be for an area that's off the spine. So what you have to do with this NOI is you have to then register it. Either you put it in the portal, you have a spreadsheet of information and you say it's this object and that object and that object and that object, or you can put it in through the API. So let me talk again about one of the other things that's going to have an impact on this NOI, which is network adjustment. Um, right, so. You may find that there are inaccuracies in the PIA data when you go out to survey. I said may, but you'll probably find there will be inaccuracies in the PIA data, and that's no reflection on OpenReach because nobody's got perfect records. I've never met anyone with perfect records yet. So anyway, you'll go out there and you'll find various things like there's a pole and it's not in the right place. It was maybe on this side of the road and it's actually on that side of the road. Or you'll find there's a chamber and it's the wrong type. So it's really small, as far as OpenReach has told you, but it's actually bigger, which means you could put a, a joint in it or something like that. You could put something in there. You'll find there are bits that are missing. So you'll go out there and there'll be a whole set of, of network and it's just not documented at all. And that can even be up to the level of an estate because if OpenReach hasn't got around to putting it back in again, you can find there are just big gaps in the data. You'll find um, inventory which doesn't exist so they'll have documented that there's um, a chamber and there isn't. You'll find there's a duct that isn't blocked or a duct that is blocked or a chamber that is silted that wasn't supposed to be silted or the route's in the wrong location. It's meant to be on this side of the road and it's on the other side of the road. All of these things will happen fairly frequently when you go out and look at the data. And OpenReach would be obliged if when you find something that's wrong with their data, you return it to them in a network adjustment. It's not quite the same thing, but I think everybody here will have heard of A55s. That's when you find that a duct is blocked, and they would like you to tell about those as well. So um, there are all these things which, which can be inaccurate in the data. So you can send them through to OpenReach to fix them, and they will correct them in the network record, which is great. So they will maybe add new elements, they will take existing elements and move them or delete them. And also things will happen when you do new builds. Sometimes people will drop a chamber on a way and so that will then split things or boxes will be upgraded. Now this is all great, that's great. The network's getting better, everything's lovely. But the problem with this is that they don't tell you about it. So you will have pulled the data to work with. So you'll have a set of ab objects that you're working with and you're planning and you're designing through. And then all of a sudden, the PIA data will change under your feet. So if there was a, if there was a, a way and they put a chamber on it, the thing that you may be planned through will disappear. Or if somebody's identified that something's in the wrong place, sometimes OpenReach will move it to the right place and sometimes they just delete it and put a new one in. And that will happen a lot um, during the course of things. And as I said, it's it would be difficult for them to tell everyone that's using their network about the changes, so they don't. So you don't get told about what would invalidate your designs 
your NOIs, your A55 submissions, etc. And the problem is, especially through the API, if you are submitting an NOI and any of the elements in the NOI don't exist anymore, which will happen often if you've maybe had a six month gap and there's another altnet in the area, then your NOI submission can't go through. And the very helpful message that you get back is, one of the elements in this NOI no longer exists, but they don't tell you which one. And that's a problem, because you can have 1,500 elements in an NOI, so which one was it that wasn't right? That's, that's a problem. So, and as I said, this will happen a lot, because if you've got two people, if you've got overbuild going on, or open reaches rolling out in the same place as someone else, there will be a lot of change on the network. Um, so therefore, this is a big problem. So, as with addresses, the best way to handle this, to get this under control, is to proactively handle it. So if you've got an active NOI, it's probably a good idea to have a process which can just perhaps, once a week, go and check if everything's still there. So it's easy enough to do. You can just go and call for the same area and get it back again and then just check what the changes were and understand them. So you have to understand what got deleted, what got relocated, what got inserted. Very much the same problem with as an address so that you can then inform the planners and the build teams of what happened. So that if something's changed, they can understand that they've got to reroute it because you can't use the same, you can't use the same network anymore. So as with anything, the earlier you get visibility of this, the earlier you can fix it in the process, which means the less trouble you're gonna have going out. As you know, you're meant to label the things you go through with your NOI, bit difficult if the thing that you're trying to label doesn't exist effectively or something like that. And the other thing about this also, those of you who are using OpenReach data, when it gets down to the time you've got to do build complete, everything has to be right. Your NOI has to reference all the right items in it. You also have to ensure that all the A55s got cleared, etc. If you can proactively understand what things have gone through and you can manage them, you will get much better build complete performance. Things will just go through without you having to rework it, which means you can complete the order. And also, um, you've got a year, usually, from raising an NOI to finishing it. So if you get lots of complications in it, it can be very difficult to do that. So managing them effectively is very important. So in summary, so I'm going to finish early, which is nice. So in summary, changes to addresses and PIA data are a fact of life. And you can wait until the problem hits you, but if you proactively manage them, it will improve your plan design build processes to all potential customers. It will enhance the productivity, or especially of working with PIA data, which is crucial but difficult, and it will improve the overall performance of key processes. Managing change. Fascinating stuff. Um, yeah, I'm Mike Thornton. I'm one of the old fashioned guys who dug up the streets about 25 years ago and we built our own network complete. Um, I'm curious, given the difficulties you've explained and, and very well done too, as to whether there's a, a cost trade off between completely fresh build versus the complexities of sharing ductworks with another operator, whether there's a proper take into account all the issues you've raised today, cost balance been struck that says it's cheaper to do it this way because. Of the change, yes, yeah. that's absolutely right. But it is the case, it, most of the old nets we've worked with have a business case which says unless they can hit at least 80% of the customers in an area using PIA, they won't touch it because they think that the, the benefits of using PIA so much far outweigh having to do all of the build themselves. But it's a good question. It does raise a lot of problems. And the, and the thing is that I think that an awful lot of people aren't aware of the fact that they've got that problem and they have to manage it. I can't, I can't tell you how many operators I've gone to tell them, you really need to worry about addresses, and they don't worry about it until they get hit, which is about two years in, at which point the problems become very big. But yeah, it's a, it's a valid question. Thank you. Any other questions? Oh, that's easy. Easy one. 
Thanks. Um, <clears throat> my name's Bill Petchy. Um, <clears throat> if an alt net puts in new infrastructure like poles and ducts and so forth, do it somehow get magically transferred to the PIA database or is it entirely separate? It depends. You can, uh, if you build on top of existing, so if you sink a chamber on top of existing, that will be an open reach asset. Or if you ask OpenReach to build it for you, then it will be an OpenReach asset, but the rest of it is yours. Does it get recorded somewhere? No, not by OpenReach, it doesn't, no. I suppose, I don't know, this is something that someone else in here probably knows. It might have to go through as part of the Streetworks information. I'm not sure. It does. Yes. <laughs> yes. There's a date, Mr. Graham Sargard um, from Box Broadband. There's a database that all utility companies should add their information to so mm -hmm. that if someone's digging and you have your own infrastructure underground, then they know that it's there. Otherwise, you could end up, just like we could end up with a cable, uh, with a yeah. gas or an electricity strike. Um, unless you actually have to wholesale because of a subsidy um, type, then an all provider doesn't need to advise where their poles are or other infrastructure. But the way the new grant allocations are going, All uh, anyone who takes subsidy in the Taipei and th the new procurements has to provide wholesale access anyway. So Ofcom and various other bodies now have got a good access, a good database of every single all provider's infrastructure and we have to provide it every three months um, to a central repository so that there's a known understanding of where all the fibre in the ground is um, and the infrastructure is. Mm. Thanks for that. Yes, and of course, it's not only OpenReach that people lease assets off. Um, there are other people that have got backbone stuff that uh, people will be using, not just dark fibre, but also routing new cables through as well. Oh, one here. Jump in. Yep. Uh, I'm Adam from Technetics. Um, on the, the um, NOIs, uh, we, you know, we're active in the market looking at different things. We've heard that sometimes the, um, the NOIs um, are a cause for what you might call bad behavior. Uh, they are, the yes, that's true. I just true. wanted to know if, what your comments are on that. And this following question was, um, do you also do the commercial modeling of the build cost that overlays on top of the, the geomatic information? Yes. Yeah, you're quite right. There has been very bad behavior with NOIs. Um, yes, there was a lot of land grab went on, particularly on poles in certain areas that we're, we're aware of. Yes, and it got abused. And, and the moment that it was easy to do it, you could bang it down. And then effectively, what people were doing was just going off and putting up bits of infra on poles in order to block other people getting there. Yes, that has happened. I think OpenReach frowned upon it and tried to clamp down a bit, but I don't know how they're monitoring on it. And yes, also, yes, because you know how much everything costs that you're going to run through, um, OpenReach provide the costings for all of it. You can figure out exactly how much the costs are going to be in terms of, um, and then when you get down to the build complete, you can pull back the bill of materials that they're going to use as well so you can compare whether or not you've got the same costings on it. Yeah, absolutely, you can, you can pull the costs back for what you're going to build. We had one of the alt nights we were working with that went for a completely different type of tech for cables where you didn't have to splice when you pulled off to go to the DPs. And they did that to avoid the cost because there's a price for leasing for looping inside chambers. So they, they completely changed their engineering in order to avoid one of the costs on it. Yeah, it is important. Thanks for that. Um, quick one for me, actually. It sounds like the onus is on the alt-nets and the operators to do something with the data to protect what they do. Are OpenReach trying anything as in to make that process better or easier? Um, not that I'm aware of. Um, as you mentioned in the intro, I worked with Comreg over in Ireland because they were trying to put together their own version of PIA, if you like. And we blue-skied all the things that you could do with that would be really useful based on how difficult it is from the other side of the, which would be to proactively tell people when there was change. Um, but um, I don't think that they included that in their recommendations because it would be quite expensive, which is probably why OpenReach aren't doing it too. Thank you. Hi, Gillian, thank you. Um, my name's Neil. I'm from Virgin Media O2. And I've also spent some time in the ABP data you know, for various planning stuff. And 
There's weird stuff in there. There is. <laughs> I, I, I had a colleague who was going through the classification codes, and they were, they were all giggling. I thought, what, what are you doing ABB classification codes? But yeah, that's where you only go. Yeah, um, so one strange one we found was it was a commercial building, and it had 100 addresses in one building. And we were very confused. We were like, do we need to go and put splitters all around this building for 100 whatever they are. When we went into it a bit deeper, we found there were serviced offices inside a block. Oh. And yes. we wouldn't actually be able to sell to service offices. Um, so my question is, who decides, the people who make ABP, who decides what's an address and what's not an address? I'm afraid that is a mystery to me as well. That's a mystery to me. I don't know. I mean, I think they must have had some really old school geographers out there at some stage because they model things like on a beach, they model a blowhole, you know, the bits where the water comes through. You think, why did anyone put an address on that? But they do. Okay, wow. So it's just a complete mix of what's been populated in there over time. By I think so. People. It's okay. very eclectic, oh. yes. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? No, thank you very much. Thank you. Round of applause, yeah.